Welcome everybody to another episode of e-commerce deep dive, a uh, monthly Amazon insights and news. I am here with Kyle Olson, our director of strategy. And, uh, this, uh, this episode, we're going to be talking about, uh, November, uh, a lot happened in November. Uh, we have general news, uh, advertising news, content updates. So we're just going to dive right into it. Uh, Kyle, starting at the top, the first item on our list is AWS outage. Yeah, I think most people on Amazon are, are aware of this at this point, but uh, we saw a pretty timely um, disruption in Amazon's AWS service the day before, sorry, two days before Black Friday. Um, so obviously most of Amazon's kind of retail and advertising operations are hosted on their own AWS servers also affected a ton of non-Amazon stuff that just used them for their cloud infrastructure. Um, but really poor timing heading into Black Friday and, and Turkey 5 caused a lot of disruption in terms of really trying to measure performance in kind of those days leading up to and, and through Black Friday, just because all of the kind of systems were lagging behind, throwing errors, hard to track sales performance, advertising pacing, things like that. Um, so definitely added a, a bit of turmoil on the start of the period. I think Amazon technically resolved that pretty quickly within about five hours, um, but the damage was was done, so to speak, in terms of, um, uh, again, just some disruption there that, that caused quite a bit of, of scrambling to make sure things were um, kind of pacing correctly. So if you ran into issues around that time with promotions, with advertising, there was a lot of, again, just issues across the board, which unfortunately I, I did think uh, negatively affected some brands on Amazon, depending on kind of how they were affected with that. Okay, yeah, good to know. That's probably a mystery that's been been solved for some folks. Um, dangerous good requirements, sounds like uh, some updates there. Yeah, so this is really a continuation of, of a trend we've seen for the past couple of months. Um, Amazon just continually getting very prescriptive with um, sort of pulling items, flagging items, et cetera, for various levels of, of safety or compliance, hazmat, dangerous goods, um, anything in kind of the, the safety realm. Uh, we've seen this just continue to augment over the past month with, you know, November actually seeing some cases where uh, brands and or items that were previously approved for certain kind of dangerous goods uh, categorizations being reflagged, having to resubmit documentation, kind of reapply for selling privileges and things like that. So um, still a lot of that going on um, across the board, um, but Amazon just continually, continuing, excuse me, to take a, a pretty broad um, approach to that and, and having vendors uh, follow up with proof that they are selling compliant products, so to speak, uh, as opposed to um, potentially having items go out that are in fact dangerous and, and causing an issue for Amazon down the road. So. I expect that trend to continue, um, you know, levels of auditing catalog details to make sure things are set up correctly is, is definitely an approach we're starting to take more broadly uh, to prevent something from being miscorrectly, um, incorrectly, excuse me, pulled, because um, we've seen quite a bit of that with this broad push, but um, something that's becoming a little more widespread and, and something I think everyone should be aware of moving forward. Got it. Um... All right. Uh, next on the list is Amazon Pharmacy. Some big news and announcements there. Yeah. So in November, Amazon uh, formally rolled out a new uh, pharmacy initiative, obviously dubbed Amazon Pharmacy. Um, I think a couple of years ago, they acquired a company called PillPack that was essentially an, an e-commerce uh, platform for uh, prescription medication. Um, so they've been in that realm for a couple of years, and I think this is the first foray of, of really doubling down in sort of an Amazon branded version of that. Um, my understanding is a lot of that is still based on the back end of PillPack, again, just with kind of the, the Amazon branding and, and some additional Amazon um, uh, support, obviously, uh, logistics, things like that. Um, so definitely a, a huge push. I know they've been focusing on, on that space for quite a while. Uh, I think from my perspective, it's a little bit to be determined on what that will exactly look like in kind of the coming months and years. Um, I believe right now, just due to the nature of you know prescription medication, super regulated, super sensitive, uh, it's not quite your normal kind of Amazon you know retail operation for for obvious reasons, but. Um, definitely a, a first step of probably many as Amazon builds that up and, and kind of integrates that with some of their other backend systems. Hey there, I'm Dave Zimmerman with Orca Pacific. I hope you're enjoying the show. 
I wanted to let you know this episode is brought to you by Orca Pacific, a Mighty Hive company. We're a full service agency exclusively focused on Amazon with capabilities for everything a brand needs to succeed on the platform. From advertising strategy, content development and SEO, to merchandising and marketing, if it relates to driving and converting demand on the platform, our dedicated teams are leaders in this space. Our robust suite of services includes expertise on the back end as well, from operational support, demand forecasting and planning, to the right fulfillment options, and higher level strategies like long-term planning, channel management, and access to beta programs. To learn more, visit our website at www.orcapac.com, that's O-R-C-A-P-A-C.com, and a business development manager will get you up to speed on how we can accelerate your Amazon business. Now, back to the show. Next on here, uh, Turkey 5 volume and capacity impacts. Um, what have we seen so far there? Yeah, so I think that really went um, as expected. Uh, we had sort of predicted based on trends we saw for Prime Day uh, with Amazon seeding the buy box sort of outside of their network. Uh, that happened with Turkey 5 as well. Uh, it actually started the Monday before Black Friday and trended pretty much all the way through Black Friday itself. Uh, and then normalized that Saturday and basically ever since. Uh, so it was a little bit interesting the way that they um, did it relative to Prime Day, where Prime Day it was literally the two days of Prime. We saw it you know, drop and kind of come back up. Uh, Turkey 5, they started sooner and actually ended doing that while within that period. So I think that may be relative to uh, perhaps their operational capacity, uh, keeping up with that demand. Um, or starting those efforts sooner, um, again, just helping them keep up and, and not fall behind, so to speak. Um, so interesting dynamics there on, on just the lost buy box front uh, in general. Uh, but overall, um, we haven't heard of, of any significant delays in, in order turnarounds or things like that. Um, definitely still some uh, operational uh, or receipt delays um, on the inbound process. And that's lingered a little bit coming out of Turkey 5 as well. Um, but that's catching up pretty quickly it just as Amazon sells through or, or ships out all of the um, demand that came through Turkey Fried and, and kind of catches up and uh, again, freeing that capacity for the, the inbound, um, which uh, is trending in the right direction. I think we'll continue really through the rest of the year. Yeah, um, that's great context. And just maybe to clarify kind of the, the and zoom out a little bit. So the initial, so what we're talking about here, um, what, hap- what we saw happen in Prime Day and predicted correctly would happen again uh, over Turkey 5 uh, holiday peak is that Amazon intentionally seeded the buy box, even though they would typically be the default winner in certain situations, they intentionally gave that up um, to diminish the amount of purchasing volume that was going to Amazon direct sales, which obviously are, are in most cases being routed uh, through a fulfillment center. So basically they knew they weren't going to be able to handle all the volume. So to get out ahead of that, they intentionally pushed some of that volume to uh, other third party sellers and other offers on the platform. Is that, am I explaining that the right way? Pretty much that's correct. Uh, but it did apply to FBA offers as well. So anything okay. within Amazon's network, you know, 1P or 3P, um, they just moved to the, you know, either dropship or merchant fulfilled offers for the most Got part. It. Okay. Yep. So, ba- okay. That makes sense. So, so just anything that involved taking a product from an FC to a, a customer, they intentionally um, uh, kind of circumvented in some cases. So, yeah. Um, uh, great. Okay. Uh, good to know. Um, all right. Moving on to content and catalog topics. Uh, So the first one on here is image requirement enforcement. Yeah, so this one's a bit specific, but we've seen um, uh, an increase uh, mostly on the 1P side, the the vendor central side with Amazon uh, really doubling down on their existing image requirements. Um, So they've had, you know, certain standards uh, in terms of what images they they allow on site, what qualifies for a main image, uh, secondary images, etc. Um, they've been intermittently enforced over the years. Um, and I think on the 3P side, much uh, less enforced in general. Um, but we've seen, uh, for whatever reason, more of a push in terms of uh, vendor submissions, uh, as well as some seller submissions being uh, rejected or just sidelined because they're not meeting those guidelines. Uh, so things like you know the main image not being just the product on a white background, not filling the right amount of white space, things like that. 
Um, so no fundamental change to the policies themselves, but just a lot more uh, actual enforcement of that. Um, so if you've been abiding by those, those kind of standards all along, pretty minimal impact, but um, maybe seeing some images being suppressed, kind of removed without notice, or um, again, reworking uh, new submissions if they're not in tune with those um, requirements uh, as Amazon's published uh, for, for a while. So um, just added kind of maintenance or, or attention needing to be put on uh, those image assets that go through onto uh, detail pages. Okay, good to know. And this is just to confirm, this is really still specific to the 1P vendor central side, the marketplace side, there's still more uh, flexibility there. Is that correct? There seems to be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Next, uh, brand store inclusion on detail pages. Yeah. So this is more of a quick update from uh, when we talked about last month. Um, just to recap real quickly, uh, we've seen brand stores getting merchandised very prom prominently on product detail pages. Um, uh, after some further just kind of research and uh, analysis, uh, we found that this uh, is a just full normal AB test on the Amazon side. There's no way to opt in as a, a vendor or seller. Um, there's no way actually for a customer to even guarantee what they'll see. Uh, we found for brands that uh, we have confirmed have this, at least in some cases, uh, it doesn't apply to all users equally. It's, it's a truly kind of customer AB test. Um, so likely more uh, variants to come on that front, but we did do a bit of review and found there is a, a pretty substantial lift in the cases that we have identified uh, have this merchandising. Uh, kind of on average, we're seeing roughly a, a 33 to 44% lift um, in sales and or traffic um, for brands that have that special tagging um, directly from their brand store. So uh, obviously it remains to be seen how Amazon rolls that out at a larger scale or on a permanent basis. Um, but if you're lucky enough to have um, kind of the, the inclusion in that A-B test, there seems to be some tangible benefits that um, uh, uh, brands are getting as a result. That's great. Um, yeah, hopefully that uh, comes out of beta and all brands get access to it. Um, but it sounds like it's been really, uh, really successful so far. Mm -hmm. um, last uh, update on the content and catalog section, uh, item setup lag times. Yeah, so we're seeing um, sort of in line with some of the um, uh, issues that are residual from AWS uh, outage, um, but really just long delays on getting new items set up. Uh, and this is actually uh, on both the 1P and 3P platforms, um, not 100% consistent across the board, um, but really long lag times for whatever reason on getting items live essentially from the point of submitting them for setup. Uh, typically, Amazon's always ebbed and flowed a little bit here um, with the normal turnaround typically being within a day. Um, I think their official SLA is a couple of days, um, but we're having cases where, um, you know, without any errors, without any actual issues or wrong information, uh, NAS submissions lagging for, you know, two or more weeks uh, before they're actually approved live and, and on site, um, really with, with no kind of feedback or direction from a, a, a problem standpoint from Amazon. So um, working to get more clarity on, on what's driving some of that, um, but we are seeing that um, uh, fairly sporadic across many different categories. And again, both platforms, 1P and 3P. Yeah, I you know, I would, my strong, um, estimate here, I guess, is that it, this is just Q4 related. Amazon tends to reprioritize a lot of different resources uh, to the customer during Q4. So um, so things that are kind of set up in process, you know, not related directly to selling product in Q4, like an NIS sheet in December, um, just get back burnered. So I would anticipate this normalizes in January, but uh, we'll update everybody uh, as as we get closer to that time. Um, so on to the last big category here, advertising. Uh, the first update is Amazon's ad revenue. Yeah, so just wanted to give a, a quick sort of call out to Amazon's uh, ad revenue performance. So the Q3 numbers came through recently and they announced essentially a, a just over 50% lift uh, year over year. Uh, in ad revenue, which is actually more than the 41% or so that they had in Q2 of this year uh, compared to last Q2. Um, I think a lot of the reasons for this this kind of explosion is, is pretty obvious. You know, uh, coronavirus, um, a lot of the shifting uh, consumer activities uh, to e-commerce and Amazon specifically, as well as Amazon's ad platform just continuing to build out and be incredibly efficient. Um, but really interesting to see those numbers and, and kind of how they shake out 
uh, it's pretty in line with what we're seeing from kind of an average sales lift perspective as well. Uh, a ton of volatility there based on, you know, specific category and subcategory, obviously. Um, but in terms of, again, kind of the scale up from a sales perspective and an advertising perspective, uh, it's keeping relatively even pace, which has also kept relatively even pace, uh, relatively even pace, excuse me, with um, uh, consumer traffic. So despite, you know, much more uh, spend going into Amazon advertising, uh, efficiency um, uh, hasn't declined significantly as a result of that increase, which is really interesting. And I think just opens up a lot of opportunity as brands start to budget for 2021 on Amazon uh, to really try to free up some some budget and allocations for uh, advertising on Amazon because of, um, again, kind of the rising tide and, and shifting dynamics here. Yep, yep, absolutely. Um, all right, next one is an update on sponsored display audiences. Yeah, so uh, Amazon published some updates to their sponsored display uh, ad type. Uh, so this is one of their kind of three main uh, search advertising uh, vehicles. Um, they've actually started to build it out to be almost more in line with their DSP uh, platform, where um, just more robust targeting opportunities where you could sort of retarget customers that have seen your detail pages but not purchased, uh, other brands or categories um, but haven't purchased that maybe related to the items you're advertising. Uh, different placements to show up uh, on or off Amazon, uh, as well as more refined targeting by uh, price, star rating, or uh, prime eligibility. So um, sponsored display has always been sort of a, a DSP light, um, but very light. <laughs> and uh, I think they're just playing with some of the um, uh, targeting features to make that a more viable and kind of usable and, and successful uh, ad type, uh, and potentially more of a way to um, move uh, advertisers up the funnel into something more like DSP, which obviously really expands upon those different targeting avenues um, much more than than something like a, a sponsored display or a search in general on Amazon. Yeah, that's great. DSP Lite, I think, is a great way of, of thinking about sponsored display and, and kind of fitting between the two ad types. So mm -hmm. uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, last one on our list. Uh, Pretty simple update here, but uh, Amazon DSP updates. Yeah, so just a quick one to wrap up. Uh, we saw DSP uh, launch officially in Brazil and Netherlands, uh, I believe in November. Um, so pretty simple update, but I think further just kind of evidence and showing the trend that Amazon's really scaling up their ad uh, capabilities across all of their marketplaces. Uh, it seems to roll out these different types of updates uh, sporadically in, in different pockets, mostly in the U.S., uh, and then scaling out from there to their other supported marketplaces, obviously. Um, but I think they're really trying to do that as quickly as possible in, in every marketplace that they live in um, and trying to just get to essentially full parity on uh, the ad tools that they have, regardless of where um, an advertiser or customer may be searching or buying in. Yeah, that's great. Um, Kyle, this has been great uh, for our audience. We will be putting these updates out monthly. So uh, if you're interested, make sure to subscribe to the podcast. You'll get the updates straight into your feed. And uh, Kyle, we will do this again for December. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, John.